And I think I'm done with this interview. Wait, well, let me just ask, let me just show you the contract, if I could, Mr. Roberts. Wait, it says here, right in the contract, that the verification is supposed to be done by DBT, that you paid them $4 million. Don't you, is, it could look to other people that you paid $4 million to purchase this election for the Republican Party, Mr. Roberts? I know you think they stole a 2000 election, and they probably stole 2004. Well, here's the bad news. In this special Link TV investigation, we've uncovered that they've already taken 2008, and it's months before November. And we've got the evidence in our election files upstairs in the office. Come on. My name is Greg Pallast. I'm an investigative reporter. I do that for BBC Television out of London. And in November 2000, I'm in my living room watching the returns from my United States of America. And I see one black face after another coming before the television camera saying, I can't vote. My name wasn't on the voter registry. I'm thinking maybe that there's some type of computer program in Florida that can single out black voters and erase their names from the voter rolls. And when a couple of weeks, got my hands on this, the computer program. Now, take a look at the report they wouldn't show you on US television. On November 6th, after all the votes were cast, statisticians called Florida for gore. <laughs> it's almost 5.30 a.m. Texas time, and George W. Bush is still asleep, and I'm still speaking to people here in Florida. Most voters in the state told exit polls they voted for Al Gore, but the Bush family remained strangely confident. Now, why did George W. grin and ignore the exit polls? I don't believe, uh, I don't believe that some of these states uh, that they've called, like Florida, we just, I just don't believe that, I don't believe we've got enough evidence to be able to call the states. We're doing better than we thought, and, um, but I feel, I feel fine. But what made George feel good made America feel ill. The vote count was a shambles. Machines failed, chads fell, and thousands of ballots piled up. The public was fed up. I think they should just re-elect, start it all over again. Cancel the whole deal that's went on now and let's vote again. The race turned on just dozens of votes, yet incredibly, by the stroke of a pen, Katherine Harris orders a halt to the ballot count. In all, 179,855 ballots were never counted. And here's the key. More than half of those not counted were cast by black voters. In fact, in Florida, an old Jim Crow segregation state, the nasty little secret of Jeb Bush's government is that, according to this U.S. Civil Rights Commission report, a black person is 1,000% more likely to have their ballot thrown out, not counted, than a white voter. And something else seemed crooked. Thousands of black voters, when they showed up to vote, were turned away because they were listed on voter registers as convicted criminals. But were they? I met with Willie Steen, like 94,000 others, he'd been tagged a criminal. He was not allowed to vote in Florida because Jeb's elections officials said he was a felon. So, Willie, fess up. Are you a criminal? No. No criminal at all. Never been convicted of any crime. But they had you down as a felon. Yes, they did, but not me. Wrong person. I've never been arrested in my life, you know. Was in the military for four years. Got out of the military, been in the medical field ever since. I mean, you can't even work for a hospital being a convicted felony. And I was in the Persian Gulf War in 91, fought in the war. So, you know, it's pretty screwed up how they did me, but um, what can I say? Tampa Elections Supervisor Pam Iorio. If you, in error, remove even one person from the voter rolls, 
it's of tremendous significance. We found errors. We were very uncomfortable with the matches on the list. The matches uh, that the state considered a match was not something that we necessarily considered a match. Sometimes the race and even the gender was not a match. Um, we were not comfortable. How did you feel when they said you're a criminal? Well, for one, I was upset, you know. Um, I was ashamed, you know, what 40 people around and it made me feel real bad. And I'm just hoping that I get a letter stating, hey, you can vote again, Willie. But Harris never sent the letter, although the state admits Willie is innocent. I, I really feel that it was bad, you know, for, for African Americans, but hey, you know, what can we do sometime? You know, what can we do? Using some legal snooping techniques, I was able to get into Florida's computers and cracked open the files that named Willie Steen and other black voters as criminals. From Katherine Harris's elections office, I decoded this list of 57,000 names of convicts matched the Florida voters. Thomas Alvin Cooper is convicted in Ohio. He's a white guy. Thomas Cooper of Florida loses his vote. He's a black guy, and he's listed for a date of conviction of his felony, January 30th, 2007. All it is is a people who have names similar to someone who's been convicted somewhere in the United States of a crime. 95% of them are completely innocent, should never have lost their vote. Now here's William Osteen, matched to Willie Steen of Florida. Over half of them are black. Almost every black person voted for Al Gore. Altogether, 94,000 voters were named as felons. Of these, 95% are innocent. And although black people make up only 13% of Florida's population, more than half the scrub list, 54% were African American. I flew to the state capitol to Governor Jeb Bush's office tower to find out who came up with this fake felon list that elected our president. All those innocent black voters, thousands who lost their vote. Was it just a coincidence? Not according to this document, which fell into my hands, which proves that the election was signed, sealed, and delivered long before any ballot was cast. The state hired a company called DBT Choice Point. This document, marked confidential and secret, indicates that the company was paid millions to create lists of criminals who should be barred from voting and then verify that those lists were correct. But Florida state officials told Choice Point not to bother verifying the names, despite Choice Point warnings that it could mean thousands of innocent people would end up losing their vote. A couple weeks after the election, Al Gore is still in the race. CBS Nightly News with Dan Rather calls me up at BBC and says, Greg, we'd love a piece of this story. What else do you have? I said, you know what? I found out. Jeb Bush, his office directly wrote a letter to remove 50,000 legal voters from the voter rolls, most of them black, almost all of them Democrats. I said, get that letter. You've got a story. They said, thanks. A day went by and no report on CBS. A week went by and no report on CBS. I finally called up CBS. I said, what happened to the story of Jeb Bush and his letter? And they said, sorry, Greg, your story doesn't stand up. I said, really? They said, yeah, the letter doesn't exist. I said, wow, how did you find that out? They said, well, we called Jeb Bush's office, and he said it didn't exist. I said, oh. So I called Catherine Harris's office, and I said, you know, Catherine Harris told me about a letter she received from Governor Jeb Bush telling her to remove 50,000 voters from the voter rolls. I know she would want me to have that letter. Could you send it to me? And 10 minutes later, I got this in my fax machine.
So how do you not count 179,855 ballots? They call those votes spoiled. How to vote spoiled? Do you leave them out of the fridge? No. It's a much more sophisticated system. I discovered this. Here in white Tallahassee, voters who made a mistake got their ballots back. back. In Gadsden, Florida, the blackest county, Voters who made a mistake had their ballots voided and never knew it. In Jacksonville, bad punch card readers failed to count 27,000 votes, almost all of them in black precincts. And Bush sued and prevented their being counted by hand. You know, it's 2004, October. BBC's already busted the felon list, but it looks like there's another trick that the Republican Party has discovered. I'm happy, I'm excited, and I'm ready to vote. Willie Steen's on his way to vote, he hopes. In the last election, he was one of thousands of black citizens stopped from voting when they were falsely tagged as criminals. He uh, went in a place to vote, and uh, I was with my son, and it's about 40, 50 other people around, and I got up there to vote, and. They told me that uh, I was a convicted felony. I told the young lady that I'd never uh, been arrested before. Enthusiastic Americans like Willie can now vote early in the weeks before Election Day. Willie sued Governor Jeb Bush after Jeb's officials were caught playing games with the voter lists, dropping legal voters, especially black ones, who overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. Hey, how you doing? Yes, we are. This is as far as Willie got last time. Well, sir, did you, did you used to live at Valley Tree? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Will he be blocked yet again? We leave Willie in Tampa to go just past Disney World to Faith World. Here in Orlando, the faithful who believe they were cheated last time, pray it won't happen again. In the last election, one million black votes were not counted. The Reverend Jesse Jackson. You don't have to have the vote the way I vote. Well, I shouldn't steal your vote. And in the name of democracy, the winner should lose, and the loser shouldn't win. Jackson fears that the Republicans have some new plan to block the black vote, not just the fake felon scam used last time on Willie Steen. There are more Mr. Steens out there. And now you have a case of this as a guy who just may be a kind of biopsy, a kind of political biopsy of a cancer that is much more widespread than just one example. You can't forget the stealing of your birthright you can't forget this enfranchisement of your vote. A hundred miles away, in the riverside town of Jacksonville, we may have found the evidence of the plan Jesse Jackson fears, something called a caging list, which could capture black voters. This is a list of nearly 2,000 voters in the black neighborhoods of Jacksonville who appear to have errors in their mailing addresses. The list was specially prepared for George Bush's campaign. There is no doubt in my mind that with your help, we'll carry Florida again and win a great victory on November the 2nd. Every one of these has to be hand entered. And we asked Ion Sancho why the Republicans might put together such a list. Sancho is a Democrat, but he's also one of the most respected and experienced of Florida's county elections supervisors. The only thing that I can think of of uh, African American voters listed like this, these might be potential individuals that will be challenged if they attempt to vote on election day. American states allow political parties to place their people right inside the polling station, like this one in Jacksonville. They can point to a voter and challenge their right to vote. Voters will be turned away with provisional ballots, which are usually just thrown out. Political parties rarely use challenges because they can bring voting to a halt. 
in Leon County, for example, we have not had one challenge voter in the 16 years that I've been the supervisor of elections. Because again, if you challenge voters, you really must do so with concrete, hard evidence, not your opinion. And this process can be used to slow down the voting process, to cause chaos on election day, and quite frankly, to discourage voters from voting. Do the Republicans have a plan to launch thousands of challenges on November 2nd and bring voting in Florida's black Democratic precincts to a standstill? This is the caging list, and this is where it was sent to the office of Brett Doster. He's the executive director of the George W. Bush for President campaign in Florida. Let's ask his team about it. I asked Republican spokeswoman Mindy Tucker Fletcher if they had a strategy to challenge these black voters on election day. I, I can't tell you right now. I don't, I don't, I'm not part of the, that strategy, but okay. I, I, this, is, this was not done in order to create a challenge list, as you, I think, were trying to get to. But they accuse Democrats of registering voters illegally, so Republicans must counterattack. So you're saying your poll workers will be instructed to challenge people to say they should have a provisional ballot? In where it's stated in the law, yeah. Are you worried that that'll gum up the uh, the voting procedures for legal By voters? By the laws? Well, that's a good question. I imagine even the people in line would want the laws applied. The law appears to be applied in a curious way in Florida. Across the road from the Jacksonville voting station, I spied someone hiding away a camera in a black SUV with blacked out windows. He was disguised in a tourist uniform complete with shorts, baseball cap, and open-toed sandals. He'd been filming every voter. I thought I'd say hello. This isn't just a hobby. You're just not doing this volunteer. No. Okay. I didn't. Okay. No. So, I'm an investigator. This is my So, do, are you a licensed investigator, or so a, a professional agency? Then it's not. Right. You're not like some free. You know, just some guy who decided no, he's going to he's going to do something because he remembered that his name was okay. Doug, but he couldn't remember who he was working for. The local congresswoman had a suggestion. The Republicans, once again, are trying to intimidate African-American voters. Uh, this car has been here since the 18th in front of the supervisor's office all day, and they have been filming. Back in Tallahassee, another election scam surfaced which could sabotage thousands of voter registrations. It targeted students with liberal views. Elections supervisor Ion Sancho discovered the scam struck close to home. This, for example, is a copy of my stepdaughter's voter registration from Orlando. And it is clear that w her own handwriting filled in blocks 2 through 15. Apparently, a petition form was placed over the top of a voter registration form. It purported to tell the citizen they were signing a petition to legalize medical marijuana. The citizen filled it in, thinking that's what they were doing. And then after the voter had left, the individual fraudulently filled out lines one, the party change, making them a Republican now, and then fraudulently signed it, and then turned the application over to the election administrator. This form changed the voter's registration from Tallahassee to Orlando. And if this voter had not known me and turned this information over to me, she may have been, she may have been disenfranchised when she attempted to vote. Is it a crime to uh, misregister someone in that way? It is a third-degree felony to do this. It is an illegal act. And the Republicans now admit it was their operatives who collected these thousands of suspect registrations, though the party denies it committed fraud. Civil rights experts in Washington fear the threat to a free and fair election is severe and unprecedented. Ralph Nees is commander-in-chief of an army of 6,000 lawyers who will take up battle stations on Election Day to protect voters from dirty tricks. This is the nerve center, but right. there will be 56 of our field offices in the 17 states, and then there will be 38 legal command centers where the majority of the lawyers will be. And there will be a law student or lawyer at every precinct. But if there are real problems, we've got mobile traveling vans of lawyers who will go to the probable precinct and make a decision. They'll keep their eyes open for mass challenges by poll watchers paid for by the Republican Party. It may be disruptive, but it's perfectly legal to challenge voters. 
But if you target the challenges at black districts like Jacksonville, you're breaking federal law. You cannot target districts with respect to challenging voters if race is a consideration. It doesn't even have to be the major factor. You cannot target on the basis of race. Thanks. Back in Tampa, Willie Steen finally gets to vote. But this happy ending was thanks only to Newsnight. The day before, he was still listed as a criminal felon. But when we turned up with cameras, his status magically changed to upright citizen who can vote unchallenged. But what about the thousands of others without TV cameras who will have to overcome the new tricks, caging lists, registration games, and more in the 2004 Battle of the Ballot? Thank you, sweetie. So what happened with the caging lists? Election Day, 2004, the Republican Party challenged over 3 million voters. 1,090,000 of those voters found their ballots tossed in the garbage. In what states? In Iowa, in New Mexico, and especially in Ohio. That elected the President of the United States. So what was the problem? The problem for the Republican Party was this. If over a million voters cast illegal votes, a felony crime in every state, how come no one was busted? Then a gentleman named Karl Rove, political assistant to the President of the United States, started contacting United States prosecutors and said, arrest them. We've got the list. Bust them. But there was one problem for the U.S. prosecutors. When they went hunting through the caging lists for the illegal voters, they didn't find any. And eight of those prosecutors said, we're busting no one. So what happened to these few good men, these U.S. prosecutors who wouldn't bust innocent voters? Every one of them was busted. Everyone was fired. In the 1992 film, A Few Good Men, Tom Cruise portrays a young military prosecutor fighting for the truth. It was based on the real-life story of Captain David Iglesias. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Greg Pallast. Greg, hi, David Iglesias. Hey, how are you, Captain? Hey, I'm doing just fine, thank you. So can you handle the truth or not? Absolutely. George Bush named him a U.S. federal prosecutor. They wanted a political operative who happened to be a U.S. attorney, and when they got somebody who actually took his oath to the Constitution seriously, they were appalled. And they wanted me out of there. The two strikes against me was I was not political. Um, I didn't help them out on their bogus voter fraud prosecutions. Last December, they fired the captain and seven others. Iglesias charges that he was fired after a meeting here between the president and his chief political operative, Carl Rove, because, Iglesias says, he refused to attack Democrats. What we know is that the Republicans successfully challenged the right of over a million citizens to vote in the last election. The Republicans used a system called caging voters, a scheme exposed two years ago by Newsnight. We revealed then that the scheme was run by a man named Tim Griffin. When Bush's attorney general, Alberto Gonzalez, sacked Captain Iglesias and seven others, he replaced them with Tim Griffin, the caging man, and Griffin's allies. But when called before Congress, Gonzalez couldn't remember what he did in December. I don't recall everyone who was there. I do not recall, I recall exactly when the decision. I don't recall, but I do not recall knowing in my mind. I have no recollection about that, but I, I presume that that is true. He lost his memory. Now he could lose his job. It didn't help Gonzalez when his assistant, Monica Goodling, testified that his people concealed from Congress the truth about Tim Griffin. I believe the deputy failed to disclose that he had some knowledge of allegations that Tim Griffin had been involved in vote caging during his work on the president's 2004 campaign. Captain Iglesias says this affair is all about dishonoring the U.S. electoral code. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. Is Tom Cruise going to play you in this follow-up? <laughs> He's more handsome, but I'm quite a bit taller, so I've got that on. After Karl Rove 
had Alberto Gonzalez and the president fire David Iglesias. He went back to active service in the Navy. In New York, I caught up with the captain. Listen up, people. Your father entered the country right there at Ellis Island, right? Right. Yeah, 1936. He was a 13-year-old kid. Yes. You know, this country stands for, for lots of good things, uh, and I've experienced lots of good things, but what I've experienced in the past six months is the ugly side of the American dream. And I, I am hopeful that I get back to the American dream and get out of the American nightmare. Well, that's the other thing is that, you know, you're a pretty good Republican. You were the, the shining boy of the Republican Party of right. New Mexico. Right. Do you feel a bit odd that they picked you out for this treatment? Yes, yes. Uh, and they misjudged my character. I mean, they, they really thought I was just going to roll over and give them what they wanted. And then when I didn't, that I'd go away quietly. But I just couldn't do that, Greg. Um, you know, U.S. attorneys and the Justice Department in general ha have a history of not taking into consideration partisan politics. That should not be a factor. What's a factor is the evidence. What does the evidence show? And what they tried to do is, uh, is just wrong and illegal and unethical, and, and I'm glad that the Senate and the House are looking into this. You know, there are five separate investigations going on right now. Well, well let me ask you, so was there political influence in your firing? They Absolutely. Say it, they say it wasn't. They say that, that you were lazy, you didn't show up for work, you didn't bring, <laughs> you didn't bring Cases against obvious, there were obvious cases of voter fraud. Right. Now, th th this voter fraud thing is 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 the boogeyman. It's it was designed to scare up, to to, to rile the base up. Uh, I looked into it. I set up a task force, which, which you're aware of. We didn't find the evidence. Process. I mean, we have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They we said didn't have it. They gave you 150 cases of voter fraud, and you didn't bring a single indictment. And they said that that just meant you weren't doing your job. Is that what was going on? Well, that's what they would say without having looked at the evidence. I actually looked at the FBI reports, and I can't imagine somebody making that judgment without looking at the cold, hard evidence. 150 cases of voter fraud. Were there indictable, fraudulent voters? They, they allege 150 cases. There are 150 reported cases, allegations. But prosecutors go beyond the allegations. They have to look to what, what can you prove in court. I couldn't prove the cases. So what now for David Iglesias? Well, I'm just I'm trying to get full vindication. I'm about 95% there. I'm going to spend the next year or so trying to get that rest of the 5%. Have you talked to John Ashcroft about this? No, but I'm thinking about doing that because I actually think that history is going to be kind to Ashcroft, a lot kinder than, than it's going to be to Gonzalez. You know, he at least had the, had the guts to, to tell the president that the, that the uh, warrantless eavesdropping program was unconstitutional. You know, are you still a Republican? Yes, but I'm a disillusioned and disaffected and angry Republican. I haven't left the party, but, but right now the party leadership has left me, to paraphrase Ronald Reagan. I mean, looking back, I feel like I was set up, that, that, that they really thought, you know, I would go forward with some, you know, half-baked prosecutions and uh, hope for a guilty plea. Well, that's not what a legitimate federal prosecutor does. Well, through using something called caging lists, they came up with lists of voters who were registered at false addresses. Did you have cases of voters listed at false addresses? Let's see. Did I have cases? There were allegations of that. There are allegations of uh, underage voters. We had a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old who were uh, registered to, to uh, vote. Um, we, we looked into that. Uh, but, but again, the burden that I had to prove was that the person who registered them falsely did so with the intent to affect the outcome of the election. And her intention was to make extra money, because she got money for every person she signed up. Now. Was Carl Rove involved in your firing? 
I'm sure he was. I, I know there were complaints made to Karl Rove by Pete Domenici. Uh, and, you know, he views everything political. He never understood. You don't, you don't factor in uh, partisan politics when it comes to uh, federal prosecutions. He came to New Mexico, Rove. He came in the fall at least twice, at least twice. One to do a fundraiser for Heather Wilson. That was the Republican candidate for Senate. Right. She was the incumbent for the House. For Congress. She was the incumbent Congresswoman. Uh, at the time she called me, she was either at dead heat, dead even heat, or she was a little bit behind her Democrat challenger. But you know what? I didn't care about that, Greg, because my job was to do law enforcement, not engage in partisan politics. So wait, so Rove came to New Mexico. Was there a connection between Rove's visit to New Mexico and your firing? Oh, I'm sure he heard an earful by prominent uh, Republicans that I wasn't doing the job they wanted me to do, which was they didn't care about the immigration cases or the narcotics cases. They cared about two classes of cases, public corruption cases and voter fraud cases. And voter fraud cases, you said there was no voter fraud. Right. And, and I know and some people make the distinction, election fraud and voter fraud. Election fraud meaning the system. Uh, voter fraud meaning the individual. Well. We looked into it, and again, the evidence wasn't there. So was George Bush involved in canning you? Yes. The, the involvement that I'm aware of that the evidence shows right now is that Domenici complained directly to President Bush, and that Bush then called Alberto Gonzalez, the Attorney General, and complained about my alleged lack of vigorous enforcement of voter fraud laws. And was Karl Rove involved in that? Did he speak to the President? I believe he did, yes. And now, of course, the president has claimed executive privilege to stop Karl Rove's assistant from testifying. Right. Do, uh, how do you feel about that? Well, the, the, the executive privilege has only been recognized since 1974. And if you look at the, the, the Nixon case, the President Nixon case, the Supreme Court ruled that it's not absolute. So I believe if push comes to shove, which I believe this will end up in court, that, that the administration is going to lose that claim. Do they have something to hide? I believe they do. I mean, there are only two reasons to claim executive privilege. One is out of principle. We don't have to turn this over to a co-equal branch of government. Or the second ground is they have something to hide. And I believe they have something to hide. What could they be hiding? Incriminating emails, incriminating memoranda, incriminating testimony by Harry Myers, Carl Rove, and uh, Sarah Taylor. So what would they be trying to, if they're trying to keep Carl Rove's assistance off the stand, what would they be hiding away? Well, I think New Mexico was just one of numerous jurisdictions in which there was it was a battleground state. There were close vote tallies, and they wanted to ensure that uh, you know this alleged voter fraud was was going to be uh, put put to rest, uh, but also to send a message to scare away voters uh, of, of the Democrat persuasion. What about Tim Griffin? Well, Tim Griffin finally did the right thing and stepped down. He, he should have never been U.S. attorney. He's fundamentally unqualified. What about his sending out? What about his sending out these so-called caging lists? It's reprehensible conduct, and it may be illegal. Do you think it's odd that he gave out these lists and then was appointed U.S. attorney? Not at all. There was a quid pro quo there. It was it was a pure or an impure political uh, motivation, and you know Bud Cummings should still be the U.S. attorney there, but Bud would not have done that. Take a look at this. This is Tim Griffin. This is the guy who is in charge of the caging operation. He's the research director and deputy communications director for the Republican National Committee. He was the assistant to Karl Rove. Caging is a crime. So did Tim do the time? Not exactly. Bud Cummins, the honest prosecutor from Arkansas, was fired because he would not bust innocent voters. He was replaced by Tim Griffin. The perpetrator became the prosecutor. After my broadcast about the caging and Iglesias for BBC television, I got a call from the office of Congressman John Conyers. He's the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. I was to meet Conyers at midnight in the hotel room in New York and show him the evidence that I had of Karl Rove, his assistant Tim Griffin, and the caging operation. By the next morning, Tim Griffin had resigned. Obviously, I've seen the, the internet stuff about caging. Uh, I'll first just say the allegations that, that are on the internet and now have spread to tabloids and what have you, 
uh, are completely and absolutely false, number one, and ridiculous. Uh, caging, uh, as you may know, I had to look it up, is a direct mail term for basically organizing returned mail. Now, I know that it has been defined newly on the internet as uh, some sort of purging voters, suppressing voters, uh, caging voters, vote caging, all these different things that go back to one guy, his name I won't mention, who wrote something about me. And when I came and rolled in the U.S. Attorney thing, he hit the jackpot because he had somebody in one of his stories was now uh, in the media. Uh, it's completely untrue, and uh, I mean, I, it's not even, there, there's not even a scintilla of uh, truth to his theory. And, uh, and uh, I'll just say that uh, it is, it's so untrue, I, I don't know exactly what you want me to say. I, I didn't do any of the stuff that he alleges so, and, and of, of course if I didn't do it, I don't know of any Karl Rove in, impact on I've seen when he says all this. This is all made up of whole fault. Um, I didn't cage boats, I didn't cage mail, I didn't cage animals. I didn't, I'm not Caging voters, firing prosecutors, obstructing them in their work, is it just bad manners or is it a crime? I thought I'd ask an expert, a dean at the law school of Pace University whose father many years ago was Attorney General of the United States and his uncle was President. Oh, uh, is that you? Yeah. You're, you're the President? Yeah. That's amazing. When was that? 61, 62, yeah, 61, 60 or 61. Mm. Okay. Just, uh, so explain this, this character. That's a, this is a Jura Falcon. There's a bunch of Falconers who work at this office. And including me, uh, the master falconer takes seven years, oh. and you have to take an exam. Oh. And I wrote the exam. You the were federal wrote? government administers. Okay. Yeah. Caging uh, is a system uh, by which you can target um, cohorts of voters uh, and get them excluded from the lists. And it's illegal in this country. And it's illegal, particularly if you. It's illegal under a number of statutes. But it's, if if you target black or minority. Voters. It's illegal under the Voting Rights Act of 1965 specifically. And also there's a 1986 court order because the Republican Party tried to use this system against black people in our country in 1986. They were caught, they were prosecuted, and rather than go to jail, they settled the case by promising that they would never engage in these tactics again. It's a felony and it's punished by high fines but also imprisonment. The way that the Republican Party has done this in the past is that they will get the addresses, for example, of all of the black voters in a particular state. Then, they'll ma uh, then they will mail certified letters to, that, to those, each of those homes. And if the voter is not there at the time that the letter is delivered, to accept delivery, the post office will automatically send that letter back to the sender, which in this case is the Republican National Committee, which spent millions of dollars getting these lists and then sending out letters to virtually all the black people in America. Um, if, if, they, if the letter comes back, the Republican National Committee uses that letter as presumptive evidence that the voter gave a false address on his voting form and is therefore ineligible to vote. The Republican National Committee will then go to the Secretary of State. In certain states, those Secretaries of State, particularly the key states like Ohio and Florida, um, were Republicans, but not just Republicans. They also served as chairs of the uh, Bush-Cheney re-election campaign. So they were closely aligned with the Republican National Committee's efforts. They will hand those caging lists of the so-called ineligible voters to the secretaries of state, and the secretary of state will then remove those voters from the list. The voter will never be informed that he's been removed from the list. Now, in many cases, these voters were not at the home because they were in school. They were stationed in Afghanistan or Iraq, or as you can see from this, virtually every one of these voters was stationed at a naval air station. 
So they were serving the military, serving our country in the United States military, and that's the reason they weren't home. Um, it's illegal to deprive them of their right to vote because they're in the United States military. So what happens in practice is that the Pentagon provides each of these military personnel who are registered to vote a, uh, an absentee ballot, which they fill out and then send to their local precinct. Of the, uh, the, the precinct receives it and sees that this person is on a list who is now ineligible to vote and simply takes that absentee ballot and throws it in a garbage can. The, uh, the voter will never know that his vote was never counted. This is the first White House in America, the first Justice Department in American history that has not gone out and, um, and, and fought and defended civil rights, American civil rights. The Justice Department historically has been the greatest friend of, uh, of the franchise, of the universal franchise. The Justice Department during the 60s, you know, when my father was Attorney General, um, w you know, went ac across the South and defended the Freedom Riders and pushed the Voting Rights Act. And um, historically, the Justice Department has been the place where poor Americans can go to get justice. This Justice Department has been exactly the opposite. They have, in fact, brought cases against individual voters to prohibit them from voting. And they have defended these, sec these crooked secretaries of state who have, um, who have deprived, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people from their right to vote. And they failed to prosecute um, time and time and time again very, very obvious, clear, blatant, and shameful violations of the Voting Rights Act and other federal voting laws. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. <laughs> after a count, a recount, and yet another manual recount, Secretary Cheney and I are honored and humbled to have won the state of Florida, which gives us the needed electoral votes to win the election. In accordance with the laws of the state of Florida, I hereby declare Governor George W. Bush the winner of Florida's 25 electoral votes for the President of the United States. I wish to point out that our American democracy has triumphed once again. It is a special day for America. It's a day in which our nation confirms the fact that we trust democracy peaceful transfer of power. Thank you, and may God bless America. Uh, please turn off that camera.